Anin, good morning. Bonjour. Minogizigad nungum, which is good loving day in the Anishinaabe Moin language. Welcome to the 15th annual Ward Summer Student Research Day. My name is Tom Chow, and I'm the Vice President of Research at Holland Burview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital and the Director of the Blurview Research Institute. I would like to begin by acknowledging the land on which we are virtually gathering today which is part of the treaty lands and territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit. Toronto has an indigenous population of 70,000, the largest in Ontario and fourth largest in Canada. The city is home to First Nations, Métis, Inuit, and those of other and multiple Aboriginal identities. Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit and the Williams Treaty signed with multiple Mississaugas and Chippewa bands. The name Toronto originates from a Mohawk word, Takaranto, meaning the place in the water where the trees are standing, which is believed to refer to the wooden stakes used for fishing by the Haudenosaunee and Huron-Wendat. We honor the sacred land and the indigenous heritage, which dates back over 10,000 years. I would like to extend a warm welcome to our board students and their families and friends to the researchers, staff, and the rest of our BRI and Holland Blurview community. A special thanks to our generous donors, the Ward Family Foundation and CIBC. Without their support, these opportunities for research students would not exist. We're gathered here today to celebrate the research achievements of 19 incredible students who were handpicked from more than 3,200 applicants from across Canada. This is the largest pool of applicants we have ever received in this program. I'm especially proud of our scientists, graduate students and postdocs and research staff at the Blurview Research Institute at a time when other research enterprises have canceled or contracted their summer programs. BRI has continued to offer this important summer research opportunity in innovative ways, despite pandemic conditions. For the past three months, our summer students have been working closely with our talented scientists and their teams. Summer students have participated in lunch and learns to gain insights about career paths and research, the family and research experience, and accessible research posters, among other intriguing topics. To our summer students, I think it's fair to say that we at the Blurvery Research Institute have benefited greatly from your enthusiasm, talent, and energy. I believe each of you have helped us to advance research that will positively impact clients and families. Your individual projects have helped us to advance towards the most meaningful futures for children and youth living with disabilities. Thank you for choosing Holland Blurview this summer. Congratulations to each of you on your accomplishments. Many thanks to our scientists and their teams in the Blurview Research Institute for the continued mentorship and dedication over the last 15 years to this summer research program. Now I would like to introduce Alan Marriage from our foundation who will provide a few remarks. Thank you, Tom. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Colin Ward. He, along with members of his family who have founded the Ward Family Foundation, have generously funded this program for our Ward students for the past 15 years, as well as the annual Pursuit Awards for many years. Colin is our former home Blurby client who has benefited from the services here at the hospital. Thanks to his family's generosity, many students have had the opportunity to learn and contribute their expertise to the exciting field of child disability research. I'd also like to extend a very special thanks to CIBC for supporting the award summer student opportunities uh, with lived experience and the Indigenous group. Thanks to CIBC's generous support, these students have had the opportunity to learn more over the field of research and pediatric rehabilitation while being mentored by some of the world's top scientists in this area. So thank you. I'll turn it back over to Tom. Thank you, Alan. I'd like to now introduce a special guest who will be co-hosting today's event with me. Truth be told, I'm really just a sidekick this year. 
Zach Raymond has been a Holland Bluevery client for many years now and has strong ties to the Bluevery Research Institute as well as to the hospital. He was the star of our research MRI video and has participated and hosted other events at Holland Bluevery. Welcome, Zach. Hey, everyone. I'm super excited to be here and co host the Ward Research event, especially with Tom. Tom, you're definitely more than a sidekick. We are both partners. Thank you, Zach. Shortly, you'll hear from our 19 Ward summer students who will deliver short virtual presentations. The students have been clustered into small groups to facilitate evaluation of the audience. Yes, we are an academic institution. Indeed, after each group of presentations, there will be a quick quiz where the audience has a chance to win a prize please pay close attention to the presentations. Zach is going to explain how to play the game. Over to you, Zach. So to play this quiz, we're using an online game platform called Kahoot. Just type in kahoot.it and you'll see a text box. We'll share the numbers on screen that you'll enter in that text box to play the quiz. How about we all give it a try now? Tom, can you demonstrate? I don't have a smartphone yet. Keep this game handy on your phone when we are doing the quiz portion of this event. Thank you, Zach. That was a brilliant explanation. There will be 10 student presentations in the next half hour. Everyone can then visit our students' virtual research booths to learn more about their research from 9.45 to 10.15. Once we come back together, the remaining nine students will present their research. Our judges have reviewed the research posters and students' oral presentations in advance of today's events. During the award ceremony, we will uh, recognize the best oral presenter and research poster uh, for their excellence. Many thanks to this year's judges for both posters and oral presentations. Joanne Winsetag, Shauna Kingsnorf, Sean Peacock, Ajmal Khan, Gloria Lee, Robin Cardi, Alana Ayaboni, Suzanne George, Manuela Comito, Timothy Ross, Jan Andersak, Melanie Penner, Anna Tenedra, Samantha Misinski, Unjung Choi, Michelle Phoenix, Yukari Siko, and Joanne Maxwell. Zach will now introduce the first five Ward Summer Student presenters. Good luck to all of our students. Zach, can you read out the names, please? Yes, the first five students are. Ethan Den Raj, Vishnavi Bamadi, Fenny Pandia, Rachel Willis, and Sarah Koreshi. Good morning. I'm Ethan Dan Raj, and my project is on brain controlled virtual instruments for children. Music training is enriching for the brain. It engages many areas and can improve sensory motor and cognitive control. However, Playing instruments requires physical movements, which presents a barrier for children with diverse physical abilities. Perhaps there is an alternative way to play music. Brain computer interfaces or BCIs may be the answer. A BCI decodes thoughts in the form of electrical activity or EEG signals into computer commands. Instead of tapping the space bar or reaching for your mouse, you control your thoughts to pause or play music. By connecting the keyboard to the computer, commands can play piano keys. A key part of a BCI is its classifier, which predicts the user's intent based on the recorded signals. It's like a meteorologist predicting rain or sunshine, given a set of weather data. In creating this BCI, different headsets, mental imagery cues, signal features, and classifiers were assessed. Pre-processing and connecting the keyboard were also completed. The results show prompts in the BCI as EEG recordings of music imagery, imagining playing and hearing an instrument can be distinguished from rest. It uses signals from the central and central parietal regions and a support vector machine classifier. BCIs like this provide alternative pathways for interactions to improve accessibility. This enables children with complex communication needs to participate in activities like music training. 
Come find me at poster one to see my attempt at Mary Had a Little Lamb. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Vaishnavi. I've had the pleasure of working on a project that examines brain synchrony between children diagnosed with autism spectrum disorders and their parents. Although synchrony may seem like a foreign concept, it occurs in nearly all of our daily intimate social interactions. Imagine you're meeting some of your closest friends for coffee. As the conversation progresses, you put on your scientist hat and start noticing that you and your friends are all mimicking each other's facial expressions, body language, and voice pitch and tone. This is behavioral synchrony. In addition to copying behavior, if you measure your friend's brain activities right at this moment, which is known as hyperscanning, you would find that the signals match, indicating synchrony of your brain as well. This concept of synchronizing behavior and cognition can also be observed between parents and their children. Since children with autism spectrum disorders tend to have difficulty in forming and maintaining interpersonal relationships, we wanted to understand how synchronization of brain waves may differ between children with and children without autism spectrum disorders and their parents using a collaborative drawing application task. We had 12 parent children dyads play this drawing game on either independent or collaborative mode. In order to capture their brain wave data, they both wore caps with optodes in them which captured brain activation data in an imaging method known as functional near-infrared spectroscopy, or FNIRS. To conclude my presentation, let me leave you with how this research may be used. Understanding how children with ASD socialize with their parents is crucial to suggesting biomarkers which can potentially improve ASD diagnosis. This research may also aid in the development of a brain-computer interface that improves current ASD therapies. Thank you all so much for your attention. If you want to learn more, please feel free to drop by poster two. Hi, everyone. My name is Fanny Pandya, and I'll be presenting my project on determining the correspondence between covert speech and speech perception. Have you ever thought an iceberg could be analogous to our brain? The underwater ice is our internal thoughts hidden to the world. This is covert speech, CS. The top half is ice everybody sees. This is like how we can identify and interpret speech known as speech perception, SP. Now imagine if we had a device to decode our thoughts and perform commands we thought of. Brain computer interfaces, also known as BCIs, can do this. Using EEG to measure electrical brain activity, BCIs translate thoughts or EEG signals and process them to a computer. Using BCI, our goal was to understand the mapping between CS, SP, using scalp topography and neural frequencies. In our study, five participants heard eight words for the SP condition and mentally rehearsed the word they heard for the CS condition. We shuffled various features found across EEG channels to see how important they were to the mapping model. We also did a causality test to see how different frequencies in CS or SP cause signals in the other condition. We found that neural gamma frequencies at 30 to 60 hertz responsible for most causality, and EEG channel clusters in temporal, frontal, central parietal areas with high correspondence. This means gamma band and specific brain regions play a role in how CS and SP are related. Our research advances BCI technology by training a device that does not need constant reiteration of thought. It's useful for kids with complex communication needs as they are restricted in participating in conversational environments. By enabling versatile communication and expression, the device would equitably support their inclusion and right to participate in society. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions or would like to learn more, please visit me at poster number three using the Zoom link. Hi, I'm Rachel, and today I'll be talking to you about the strengths and challenges of a group cognitive behavioral pain management program for children and youth with CP. Children with cerebral palsy often experience chronic pain related to their medical condition, with parental responses to their child's pain impacting coping mechanisms. The WHO has defined the gold standard for management of chronic pain in pediatric populations as biopsychosocial interventions. Cognitive Behavioral Therapy, or CBT, is a psychosocial intervention which has been seen effective in the treatment of chronic pain in children. However, no studies to date have explored the use of CBT to treat chronic pain in kids with CP. This brings us to our study, which will explore the feasibility of a CBT program for children with CP and chronic pain and their parents. 
I'll be focusing on the qualitative aspect of this study and hope to answer the following question. In the study, intervention consisted of six sessions of a group CBT program with separate groups for children and parents. Following the intervention, interviews were conducted with three children, five parents, and two clinicians who took part in the study. Analysis was done using in vivo qualitative analysis software. The main finding of our study is that it is feasible to conduct a CBT program for children and youth with CP and their parents. Strengths of the program included the learning experience, inclusion of parents in their child's treatment program, and social support provided by the group. Challenges of the program included group variability related to age, cognitive abilities, and pain experience, as well as logistical challenges, including time of day and session length. We aim to use results of this study to inform a larger multi-site study exploring the use of CBT to treat chronic pain in kids with CP. If you'd like to learn more about our study, please come visit me at poster number four. Thank you. When we think of home, what comes to mind? For many of us, this question may incite feelings of comfort, security, and happiness. But what is it about your home that makes it feel like your home? Is it your pictures on the wall? Or is it that big window that has a great view? How our homes are designed affects how we interact with and experience our surroundings. Given the impacts of housing design, it is troubling that little is known about how youth and adults with developmental disabilities experience housing. Unfortunately, their views are often excluded from housing design processes and not much is known about their design preferences and experiences. With this gap in mind, we conducted a scoping review that engages the following question. What does the literature tell us about housing design interventions that impact the quality of life for youth and adults with developmental disabilities who are not living with their family? This involves searching five databases using keywords related to housing, design, and disability. We identified and reviewed 17 articles. We found that architectural features that are perceived to be more home-like increase quality of life. We also found that home-likeness enhances the social participation of residents with developmental disabilities. And in some cases, the interior design of housing facilities were determined by staff rather than residents. This research indicates that there is a crucial need to identify best housing design practices and guidelines that emphasize home likeness and engagement as its key principles. At the same time, housing design policy and processes need to be questioned with respect to how they include the developmental disability community. This research will contribute to the advancement of accessible housing design and policy. If you take one thing away from this presentation today, let it be this. Home likeness matters, and everybody deserves to have a place that feels like home. If you would like to learn more, please visit me at poster number five. Thank you. Fascinating presentations by group number one. Now it is quiz time on Kahoot. You can see the address just above me, and uh, to my left is what you should be seeing on the screen. Greg, can you share the screen with game pin number one? Everyone kindly enter the numbers that Greg is going to show, and you have 10 seconds to answer the two questions. BNL. Congratulations, BNL. You will be contacted by email on how to play your prize a state of the art $10 gift card. Now we're going to hear from the 
from the next group of students presentation presented by the Ronessa Das, Elena Jane, Alexandra Colville Reeves, Joelle Lee, Maria Becerra. The system pain is a condition that most attribute to the elderly. But did you know that as many as 38% of youth in North America are living with this condition as well? This potentially lifelong condition can be so severe that some children are unable to go to school, play with their friends, or even watch their favorite movie. To manage pain levels, most professionals recommend non-pharmacological treatments. In other words, treatments that do not include the use of drugs. Instead, these treatments utilize the collaboration between healthcare professionals such as physical and occupational therapists, family doctors, and many more. This is the preferred and safest approach to treatment as it avoids harmful side effects or dependency issues. However, the challenge is that as many as 29% of youth with persistent pain also have a mental health disorder and non-pharmacological treatments may not be as effective for them. As such, we're conducting a systematic review to answer the question, how effective are non-pharmacological treatments for youth with persistent pain and a comorbid mental health disorder? We created an extensive search strategy with over 100 terms. We then applied those terms to four medical databases to identify peer-reviewed randomized control trials. Our search yielded 9,620 results, and we are currently critically examining the title and abstract of each. To obtain our results, we will extract information on patient outcomes such as pain intensity or quality of life. For our next steps, a formal review of our findings will be disseminated to clinicians at Holland Blurby's National Leading Program in Pediatric Persistent Pain Management, Get Up and Go. We will then use their insights to devise a plan to transfer our findings to the general public. This project falls in line with Holland Blurby's mission for innovation and excellence as it aims to identify areas of improvement for current treatments. In doing so, this project will promote equitable health care to ensure that youth with persistent pain and mental health disorders are receiving the best possible care. Most importantly, the relationship between persistent pain and mental health is important to emphasize as since they are not physically visible, many individuals have difficulty understanding their impact. For more information or to learn more, come visit my poster, scan its QR code, or click its link for an accessible information sheet. Thank you. Hi, my name is Alana Jane. My pronouns are she, her, and today I will be presenting my project about a qualitative analysis of the recommendations from Project Echo Ontario Autism. You may be wondering, what is Project Echo Ontario Autism? To illustrate, let's use an example of Dr. Johnson. Dr. Johnson is a pediatrician who recently saw a child with autism spectrum disorder, or ASD, in her clinic. The child and their family came to Dr. Johnson with a complex set of behaviors and other conditions, and the doctor was not sure how to best take care of this child. In fact, research shows that community practitioners report a lack of knowledge and confidence in treating children with ASD, which may lead to unmet healthcare needs. Now, what if I told you that there is an interdisciplinary team of specialists, allied health professionals, and parent advocates who are available to help discuss this case and come up with recommendations of best practice care? That's what Project Echo Ontario Autism is all about. This program currently runs out of Holland Floorview, and to date, there have been over three cycles of cases, with each one generating a list of recommendations. In order to analyze the content of the recommendations and draw conclusions, a qualitative analysis is underway to identify categories of recommendations and their frequency. To do this, we use a method called coding, where we read the text and decide on the key themes and ideas and make note of what those are. Myself and my colleagues, Lisa and Animal, pictured here, have been working together to develop a coding guide and independently code all recommendations, after which we meet regularly with Dr. Penner and consolidate our codes and into generating overarching categories. Of the 405 recommendations, we have identified 46 codes which, which fall into seven broad categories. These include categories of diagnosis, concurrent mental and physical health conditions, referrals, accessing community resources, providing education and guidance, management strategies such as eating, physical activity and social skills, and client and family-centered care. This is the first time these recommendations have been characterized and grouped into categories. With this information, we hope to publish these results in the literature so that other physicians and providers can be informed, resulting in better overall care for clients with ASD and their families. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. If you'd like to learn more or have questions, please visit me at poster number seven. I hope to see you there. Hi, my name is Alexandra Koval Reeves, and this summer I was in the Propel Lab working on a wearable system to assess walking symmetry in individuals with lower limb impairments. 
Individuals with lower limb impairments often experience uneven walking patterns, also known as gait asymmetry. This can be due to uneven loading between the prosthetic and intact limb, and it can sometimes be challenging to correct this during rehabilitation as it can be hard to assess the asymmetry visually, and it can also be difficult to communicate exactly what the individual needs to do in order to correct their gait. However, if there was a way to quantify all the aspects of the walking pattern and also provide real-time audio or vibrotactile feedback directly to the user, it would then become much easier to match the walking pattern and hopefully achieve gait symmetry. The main three aims of this project are first to accurately identify the toe-off and heel strike events during the gait cycle. Secondly, to quantify this asymmetry while walking. And finally, to provide the user with biofeedback through a phone app. In terms of methods, first an algorithm was developed to identify the heel strike and toe-off events from the sensor's angular velocity data, which is plotted here. The zero crossing point highlighted in yellow was a key marker for determining both of these events. Then to test the algorithm, two sensors were attached to the shank of the subject and the sensors then interfaced with the Android app to store and display data while the individual walked. The data collected using the wearable system was then compared to data collected using a 3D motion detection system. The results shown in the graph here, as well as the mean timing errors, show that the wearable system was able to detect heel strike and toe off events with high accuracy. This then allowed for reliable symmetry index values to be calculated, which will then be used in the biofeedback phase of this project. In conclusion, this wearable system has large potential as a physiotherapy training tool. Additionally, it's specifically advantageous as it allows individuals to con continue their rehabilitation outside of a hospital setting. And finally, the device was designed to be completely portable and user-friendly in order to promote more consistent usage. Thank you for listening and I would be happy to answer any questions. I will be at poster number eight. Hi everyone, my name is Joelle Lee, and today I'll be sharing an introduction to my team's project, which focuses on creating virtual spaces for the formation of friendships. Making friends is not always easy. Many barriers hinder friendship formation and maintenance among children and youth with disabilities, which puts them at a greater risk of social isolation. For instance, reduced mobility may hinder full participation within in-person play activities, or kids may live far away, perhaps in rural areas, with a lack of affordable and accessible transportation options. Well, a possible solution is virtual spaces and programs, which may remove barriers and make it easier to make friends. As society becomes increasingly more digital, it is important to focus on ways to help children connect and interact online. Our team set out to answer the question, what strategies can inform the intentional design of and access to virtual spaces and experiences that afford opportunities to foster greater social connection for children and youth with diverse disabilities? We performed a scoping review by searching four different databases, including Medline, Embase, Scopus, and ERIC, and identified about 10,000 records that were screened by three researchers using a predetermined inclusion-exclusion criteria a snippet of which you can see on the screen. Afterwards, a preliminary thematic analysis was conducted. You might be wondering, why is this important or relevant to Holland Bloorview and its clients? It's well known that social support is an important aspect of a child's development, decreasing anxiety and increasing self-esteem. We hope our review will guide service providers on the design of online spaces that give children additional opportunities to foster meaningful friendships and expand or deepen their social network. If you would like to learn more, then visit virtual poster number nine. I hope to see you there. Hey everyone, my name is Maria and I'm gonna be sharing some of the work I've done this summer with my team. For this project, we set out to examine the online friendship experiences of children and youth with disabilities. As the COVID-19 pandemic has shown us, the internet is a powerful tool for connecting with others, even in the midst of isolation. Social media, chatting apps, and online gaming platforms have shown great potential for forging and maintaining connections between people who are unable to meet in person. So what if we harness the internet's power for connection for children and youth with disabilities, 
so that they can connect with their peers too. My team first set out to examine the potential of online platforms for fostering friendship among youth with disabilities through a literature search. We searched five databases looking for studies which discussed the social experiences of youth with disabilities online and found over 10,000 studies. The article screening process is ongoing, but so far we've identified seven studies that meet our criteria. From our studies, we've identified five key themes that summarize some of the benefits of online social interaction as described by youth with disabilities. For example, study participants describe being able to form and maintain long-term friendships via virtual platforms and describe greater comfort interacting via online platforms compared to face-to-face. -to -face. They also acquired new social and emotional skills via online interaction and described having greater control over their social life on online, including being able to choose who to interact with and when to interact. Our findings show that online platforms have great potential for fostering social connection for children and youth with disabilities, especially for those with mobility concerns who are unable to attend in-person programming or for those who are having trouble making friends because of their disability. Colin Bloorview patients may especially benefit from more social programming through online platforms. This might look like weekly Minecraft game nights for patients or perhaps a private monitored gaming community hosted on Discord, a popular social platform for gamers. The possibilities are endless. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions or want to learn more, be sure to visit me in the poster 10 Zoom room. A bedazzling display of talent by group number two and such critically important topics of study. Now it's time for quiz number two. Greg, can you share the next game pin? Wait. Congratulations, Spencer. You have won a $10 Tim Hortons gift card. You will be contacted by email on how to claim your prize. Then you can go eat some donuts. <laughs> wow. Tom, I'm so impressed by all the research presentations so far. What do you think, Tom? Indeed, Zach, I'm always inspired by our summer students' youthful energy and eloquence. Okay, everyone has a chance now to meet our ward students in their virtual booths for half an hour. Greg, can you add the link in the chat box where people can find the Zoom links to meet our students? Thank you, and hope you enjoy speaking to our students about their fantastic and amazing research. We'll see everyone back in the Zoom webinar at 10.15 a.m. If you did not remember the link, go to hollandborbu.ca forward slash events, then click on the July 20th event. Now we're going to hear from the following five students. Maria, Marina, sorry, Charlam Papulu, Hamshi Sugamfan, Felicia Lu, Sarah Marshall, and Spencer Arsenal.
Hello, everyone. My name is Marina, and I'm happy to present to you today my work on the impact of educational and health services on the mental health status changes of children with autism spectrum disorder during the COVID-19 pandemic. It is widely known that the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting emergency measures have radically changed our daily reality. Detrimental mental health impacts of the pandemic for adults, children, and youth populations have been widely reported. The question is, how are these new circumstances affecting more vulnerable populations, such as children and youth with ASD? This is the question that we sought to answer in our research. Provided the wide use of services in these populations, we're particularly interested in the disruption of services. Specifically, we're interested in the impact of the loss of academic, psychological, medical, and allied health services on the mental health outcomes of children and youth with ASD. In our analyses, we looked at reported changes in externalizing symptoms, which included irritability, hyperactivity, and inattention, as well as internalizing symptoms, including anxiety and depression. We also looked at the reported use of acute mental health services. In order to answer these questions, we used the reports of the parents of 265 children with ASD. What did we find? In terms of service use, the greatest loss of services was in the medical domain, followed by the loss of academic services. We also found a significant association between the loss of medical services and the use of acute mental health services. And the significant association also existed between the loss of academic services and the worsening of externalizing symptoms. Where does this leave us? This findings confirm the reintroduction of services as a priority to academic and medical services may be most beneficial. Our results also point to the importance of the development of substitute services during times of crisis for children due to ASD. Evidently, we need to find more effective and more innovative ways to meet the demands of these populations. Thank you for your time. And for any additional information, please visit poster number 11. The patterns and impacts of technology use in children and youth with autism spectrum disorder, ASD. In this day and age, technology is everywhere around us. In fact, you're using some piece of technology to view this. However, the real question is, how does our exposure to electronic screen media, ESM, impact our lives? Excessive ESM use is negatively correlated with the physical and mental development of children. But the keen interest of my study is to address the gap of how this translates to children with ASD, who are reported to have higher screen time exposure than typically developing or TD children. Thus, my objective is to identify the parent-perceived impacts of ESM use on children and youth with ASD. The methods used for this study was a 44-question parent report survey that addressed the different factors and parent-perceived impacts of ESM use on children. Multinomial logistic regression and statistical analyses were performed using R. The sample data consisted of 611 participants that were categorized into three groups, ASD, mixed, and TD, with the following age and gender parameters. The results of the statistical analyses performed on the sample data was that the parents of children with ASD had a significantly higher likelihood of reporting a positive impact both on the child and on the family compared to those of TD children. This is evident in the p-value as well as the odds ratio in the figure below. The figure on the left shows the parent responses for how they perceive technology used to impact their child. As more visibly shown with the donut chart, parents of children with ASD reported positive impacts on the child 11.2% more than those of TD children. Similarly, the figure on the left shows the parent responses for the perceived effects of ESM use on the family as a whole. As shown by the donor chart, parents of children with ASD reported positive impacts on the family 8.37% more than those of TD children. From these reports, conclusions can be drawn that children with ASD experience increased positive parent perceived impacts of ESM use compared to TD children. Thank you for listening and please visit poster number 12 for more using the QR code. Hi everyone, my name is Felicia and I'll be presenting my project on examining the association between temperament emotion regulation, and anxiety in children and youth with autism spectrum disorder. So emotion dysregulation and co-occurring anxiety disorders are quite prevalent in youth with ASD, and they can persist over a lifetime, impacting physical and mental health, psychological and social development, as well as areas such as school and work. Although there are currently no known predictors, temperament, which are your innate patterns of feelings and reactions, they may play a key role in your emotion regulation, but this is yet to be explored explicitly in children with ASD, as well as in older age groups. So, my project aimed to examine, first, how temperament profiles are characterized in youth with ASD, as well as in typically developing youth, and then to see how these particular temperament profiles impact emotion regulation and anxiety. 31 children with ASD and 37 typically developing children were included in the study, and the parents of all of these participants completed a demographics questionnaire, the TMCQ temperament measure, EDI for emotion regulation, 
as well as the scared anxiety measure. And then we used all of these results in Wilcoxon tests and linear regression to explore the diagnosis correlations. So we did find a significant difference in the temperament profiles with the ASD group showing lower epiphyll control and higher negative effect compared to the TD group. Results also indicated that temperaments of lower epiphyll control uh, correlated to higher reactivities and temperaments of higher negative effect correlated as well to higher dysphoria and higher anxiety. So these findings improve our understanding of the temperament predictors associated with emotion regulation and anxiety. And then by looking into replication in the larger sample size and implications in clinical care, um, these findings can help to assist in personalizing and targeting future interventions for youth with ASD. Thank you so much for listening and please enjoy the rest of Research Day. Hello. My name is Sarah, and my project is titled Adapting the Teach ABI eLearning Module for High School Educators. I completed this project in the Novel Lab, supervised by Dr. Shannon Scratch. Acquired brain injury, or ABI, is an umbrella term referring to brain damage that occurs after birth from a traumatic event, like a fall, or a non-traumatic event, like a stroke. Symptoms vary and can include deficits in cognitive, emotional, and behavioral domains. Despite these symptoms, ABI is not recognized as an exceptionality by Ontario's Education Act. This can make it difficult for these students to access special education resources and may impede educators' ability to identify and support students with ABI. The Novel Lab has developed an e-learning module to address this gap in educators' knowledge, starting with a module to serve elementary educators. But high school is a very different context, with older students, different student-teacher relationships, and a different school organization. So we're now working to adapt the module to better support high school educators. Previously, interviews were conducted with high school educators to examine the adaptability of the module. My work took this interview data to make the appropriate modifications. Based on the educator feedback, I made modifications in three main areas. First, discussing the challenges created by the rotary system. This is the school organization where students have a different teacher for each subject in the day. So for example, I added a tip sheet addressing concerns that the educators had about Rotary. Second, changing the case study to a high school context. The original case study was of a grade four teacher and his student. Now the case study is about an English teacher and his grade 10 student. Finally, changing some specific strategies in the module to fit the high school context. For example, I added a strategies for social outcomes slide to reflect the social aspect of high school. By informing educators, we aim to make the classroom more supportive for students with ABI. If you'd like to hear more details about this project and its next steps, you can check out poster 14. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Spencer Arshinoff, and this project is looking at whether or not sensory differences in autism spectrum disorder help explain emotional dysregulation and anxiety in children. One of the biggest challenges faced by kids with autism spectrum disorder, or ASD, is anxiety. 54% of children with ASD have an anxiety disorder. This is much higher than average, although it's not exactly clear why this number is so much higher. One of the possibilities is that it has to do with sensory sensitivity. As you may already know, one of the traits seen in ASD is atypical sensory sensitivity, which could lead to anxiety. Another possible reason for high rates of anxiety in ASD is the inability to regulate emotions. For our study, we recruited 31 children with ASD and 37 typically developing children and asked their parents to assess their anxiety levels, emotion regulation ability, and sensory sensitivity to see if they were correlated. So not super surprisingly, we found that anxiety and sensory sensitivity were correlated in participants with ASD and not typically developing participants. But for anxiety and emotion dysregulation, the opposite was true. There was a correlation only in typically developing participants. Based on the previous literature, we expected the opposite. It's possible that our sample sizes just weren't large enough or that the male to female ratio of the ASD group was off. So what does this mean? Well, if sensory sensitivity and anxiety are related in ASD, we still have to figure out which one causes the other, or if there is a third unrelated factor that is associated with both. Also, this could mean that we need to reconsider how we treat anxiety in children with ASD. Maybe our approach needs to keep in mind the sensory aspect. Thank you all for listening. 
To learn more, you can visit poster number 15 on the Research Day 2021 website. Thank you, group number three, for those most intriguing talks. Time now for quiz number three. Greg, can you share the screen with the game pin? Congratulations, Hamsu. You have won a $10 coupon gift card. You will be contacted by email on how to claim your prize for all your hot chocolate or coffee needs. Now, we're going to hear from the final group of presenters, presented by Sophie Weaver, Anna Karakidis, Daniel Nicolardi, Danielle, sorry, Danielle, Madeline Murray. When you think about childhood, what comes to mind? For many of us, we think about playing, whether it be on playgrounds, in parks, or in our neighborhoods. This is because play is a quintessential part of being a kid. For children living with a disability or chronic illness, childhood may involve doctor's visits, medical procedures, and even hospitalization, which can cause them to miss out on this key component of growing up. This is a notable issue given that play can be therapeutic, mitigating a child's negative feelings during hospitalization and aiding in recovery. To help ensure hospitalized children can experience play and its benefits, it is important that healthcare settings have adequate play spaces to facilitate the process. However, little is known about the designs and experiences of play spaces and healthcare settings. To help fill this gap, we conducted a scoping review that asks, what does the literature tell us about the design and experiences of play spaces in pediatric healthcare settings? We searched six databases using key terms related to play space, pediatric, and healthcare. After screening 2,533 articles, we found that only 15 focused on the experience or design of play spaces in healthcare. Initial findings suggest that play spaces in pediatric healthcare settings should be accessible and inclusive for all and encourage social interaction. Further, some important design features to consider include good seating and lighting, quality pathways, and nature elements. Very little research has been conducted on playgrounds and healthcare settings, despite their tremendous ability to foster play. This scoping review highlights the paucity of literature in this area, indicating a need for future research to explore the designs and experiences of play spaces and, in particular, playgrounds in healthcare settings. For children to reap the therapeutic benefits of play, it is beneficial for them to have access to welcoming play spaces. This research may help Hall and Bloorview optimize both current and future play spaces and, in turn, may enhance the quality of care delivered to children and their families. Play is important. Children living with disability or chronic illness do not need to miss out on play. Going forward, this research will help to ensure that the most important occupation of childhood, that is play, is available to all children. Hi, my name is Anna Kirikidis, and I'll be presenting a scoping review I've been co-authoring on mental health interventions for siblings of children with disabilities. So healthy siblings of youth with disabilities are often described as invisible children. This is because siblings are often overlooked in this type of family unit due to the inevitable and complex care other families must provide the child with special needs. Now, unfortunately, this does put the well sibling at a significantly greater risk for poor mental health, including social, emotional, and behavioral problems. Though support programs specifically catered to siblings do remain rare, those that have been conducted were found to be effective in offering these children the services they require. 
So the goal of our scoping review was to identify the key characteristics of previously implemented interventions and see which elements of treatment were most effective in promoting positive health outcomes for this population. With this information, we will then be able to go forward and design much needed treatments for a neglected community. After a search generated over 6,000 articles, we narrowed it down to 40 intervention studies eligible for full tax review. While the study remains ongoing, our preliminary results indicate that the most effective treatments are facilitated in a group setting in which siblings have the opportunity to meet others like them and form positive relationships. Prior to intervention, siblings were prone to experiencing feelings of loneliness and exclusion, but through the social pedagogy aspects of group therapy, recipients were able to improve their self-esteem, build resilience, and gain sense of unity with their peers. Thank you for listening to my presentation, and if you would like to know more about this study and its next steps, be sure to visit the poster number 17 on the 2021 Research Day webpage. Thank you. My project in the Epic Lab is on the importance of place in pediatric palliative care. Talking and thinking about death can be hard. However, planning for it is important. Where people die matters. Their preferences matter and how they experience care matters. Nearly 1 million children around the world die from a life-limiting terminal illness. Therefore, we ask, what is the importance of place in pediatric palliative care? We conducted a literature search drawing on scoping review methodology to obtain existing literature. Five health science databases were searched, resulting in 25 documents discussing the importance of place in PPC. We found that there were several factors that influenced place of death, including comfort, safety, socioeconomic status, and cultural and spiritual significance. There are also three distinct locations where PPC is received, including home, hospital, and hospice, with home being the preferred location of death. However, these preferences are largely coming from the parents' perspectives, with limited literature exploring children's preferences. The UN Convention on the Rights of a Child outlines that children are legally entitled to play an active role in matters pertaining to their care. Engaging children about their PPC experiences and preferences is integral to providing client-centered care. Place plays an important role in the experience of children and families receiving palliative care. However, the limited literature on the perspectives of children compromise our understanding of their experiences and desires, which can impact our ability to plan and provide effective and client-centered palliative care to children. Where children receive care matters, where they're born, where they receive medical treatment, and where they die. This research is a stepping stone in filling the gaps related to the meaning of place in pediatric palliative care. Holland Bloorview prioritizes empowering children and families in care by fully integrating them in care planning, research, and resource development. This research may help Holland Bloorview inform and support children and families with pediatric palliative care decisions concerning where this care will take place, why it is important, and how to make it happen. Thank you for listening and come visit me at Poster 18. In our increasingly virtual world, social media serves as a bridge to allow us to connect with one another and share knowledge. Free to download, we're told these apps are accessible to everyone. That is not the case. Healthcare organizations are increasingly using platforms as a form of communication to connect with clients, supporters, and funders. But how are healthcare organizations that serve the autistic community representing autism and equity, diversity, and inclusion, also known as EDI in their social media? This was the goal of our project. We scanned three social media platforms of seven healthcare organizations and recorded any content related to autism or EDI. As the study progressed, it became evident that beneath the inclusive cover, there was a much more complex narrative. Many of these organizations had accessibility issues, including no image descriptions or alt text, making the content unavailable to screen readers, as well as limited captioning on videos. Most content on autism did not appear to be informed by those in the autistic community, highlighting the importance of nothing about us without us and engaging with those with lived experience. This same sentiment was also highlighted in posts about EDI. Some posts related to social issues appear to engage in performative activism and tokenism. These issues show the importance of remembering that not everyone who uses social media is the same and engages in the content differently based on their own abilities and backgrounds. Keeping this in mind is essential to creating inclusive platforms. Social media has the power to shape and change the way that we see the world. Healthcare organizations must be aware how their content has the ability to inform audiences' understanding of social issues. For these organizations to make the most of these tools, they must improve the accessibility of posts, engage with individuals with lived experience, and move beyond tokenism to engage meaningfully with EDI issues. 
Social media should be accessible everywhere and to everyone. However, that is not the true story of the current state of these platforms. Healthcare organizations have an opportunity to lead the way in providing accessible and inclusive social media. They have the power to change this narrative and to help ensure equitable access for all. Thank you. Thank you to all of our award summer students. I remain thoroughly impressed with both the quality and magnitude of work achieved in just three months. You're also articulate. Every one of you presented like scientists. I'm personally moved by the suite of important topics that you undertook this summer. Now it's time for the final quiz. Greg, over to you for a game, the game pin. Thank you so much. Congratulations, Maddie. You have won the final team card of the day. You will be contacted by email on how to claim your prize. Thank you, Zach. Before we announce uh, this year's best poster and uh, oral presenter winners, I'd like to say that we are so fortunate to have the exceedingly high caliber of esteemed scientists and teams guiding our summer students this year. So thank you to all of our scientists. This year, we have 19 summer students. The number 19, just a fun fact, is a centered hexagonal number, meaning that you can create a hexagonal lattice by drawing one dot in the center and the other 18 dots in a hexagonal pattern around the center dot. This obscure fact is actually very useful for maximally packing things into a circlic container, like a can. So for example, if you had 19 pencils and you wanted to put them into a uh, cylinder, uh, arranging them in this hexagonal pattern would be the most space efficient way to put those pencils in there. Our 19 summer students have undoubtedly packed a lot into their three months with us. Together, they have formed a circle of knowledge, friendship, and encouragement, which I hope will persist beyond this summer. Zach, would you like to share your reflections? My reflections on all these projects was that they were amazing. They didn't stop at anything in their presentations. No matter what they found, they were determined to do all of it. It was packed with information and they really thought about how it was gonna be used in the next generation. It's our pleasure now to announce this year's winners for the top poster and best oral presentation. For the best poster, the winner is Danielle Nicolardi. Congratulations, Danielle. For the best oral presentation, the winner is dun, 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 Elena, Elena James. Sorry, Elena. Oh. Wait, <laughs> I'm hearing something from my technician. Guess what, Elena James? You're not the only one. It's a tie for best oral presentation. It was so good, the judges couldn't pick. So, 
Sophie Weaver. You have also won the best oral presentation. Can we give a round of applause to all our winners? Thank you to all our Ward Summer students for sharing your posters with us today and for giving us the opportunity to learn more about your work. And Zach, you are awesome. So this has been for me a hope-filled celebration of your summer achievements to all our summer students. The field of childhood disability is stronger because of your contributions. Miigwech. I will now invite Manny Kang, Glory Research Institute's Director of Research Operations and Business Development to provide some closing remarks. Thank you, Tom. As we come to the end of today's event, I would like to thank everyone for joining us to celebrate our incredible World Summer Research students. A very special thanks to our incredible host, Zach, uh, our host today in making this year's event extra memorable. Thank you to our judges, both poster and oral presentations, and to the many families who joined us to listen today. As well, a big thank you to our scientists uh, for continuing to mentor and share your knowledge with researchers of tomorrow. I would also like to acknowledge the BRI's operations team for organizing this year's incredible event. A big thanks goes out to Anna Tendera and Flora Wan who helped facilitate the lunch and learns to immerse our students in the field of childhood disability research. Special thanks to Bianca Lopez, our communications and public engagement intern, uh, Kathleen O'Brien, our events consultant and coordinating all the marketing materials as well as getting the word out to all of you. Want to give out a a uh, big shout out to Jeannie Fong for all the behind the scenes work and endless hours she has put into making this event possible. And thank you to our Ward family and the CIBC for your support. Thank you for making a real and meaningful impact in the lives of kids with disabilities. Finally, thank you to all our amazing Ward students for helping to shape a future with no boundaries for all children and their families. We hope you enjoyed the Ward Summer Student Research Day and thank you again for attending and participating. We hope to see you again next year. Now I'm going to turn it over to Zach for a final few words. These projects were amazing. I am blown out of the water by all the time and research you put into them. And I can't wait to see what happens next year. Thanks, Zach. I hope you can join us next year when we can hopefully host this event in person. Uh, and all the best, and thank you for uh, attending today. May I ask the summer students and Zach to stay on the webinar for a few minutes just to take a virtual group photo. <laughs>